good morning friends so from today we are going to start our new lecture series related with history of english literature myself professional swapnil kosavi sir and from today i am going to start new lecture series on the history of english literature so firstly we are going to start on anglo saxon age so here i want to continue it so at the beginning we are going to talk about origin of english literature how there was the origin of english literature as well as before that how there was origin of english language especially if we want to understand the history of english literature it is essential for us to know about the people who have produced this english literature because we know very well that the english are composite race because various racial elements have entered into their making such as celts anglo saxons danes normans the celtic people were different from the other three people means the celtic people were different than anglo saxons danes and norman people as the celt were practically displaced by the teutons the englishman of today is essentially teutonic in character tempered by celtic the celtic strain is stronger in scotland and is dominant in wales for the welsh are the only true descendants of ancient celts now we try to consider briefly each of these four people whose mixing together has produced the english nations firstly we will talk about the celts whom we can pronounce celts s e l t s r celts k e l t s so celts or celts we can pronounce it the word c e l t s so these celts were a branch of indo europeans and these indo europeans had settled in western europe including italy france and spain they settled in the 6th or 7th century bc the celts of gaul who settled in france they also called gali g a w l i these gali were conquered by julius caesar they were after absorbed by the romans these romanized gali were conquered they were absorbed by the franks and these franks people were a group of barbaric germanic tribes towards the end of the 15th century anno domini after the fall of the western half of the roman empire clovis c l o v i s was the first king of the united franks he adopted christianity along with his subjects yes subjects mean people he is generally regarded as the founder of french nation clovis was the founder of french nation and the important point we must keep in our mind that france is the both german and roman especially roman was dominated 
on the France. The Celts of Ireland call the Gaels, G A E L S. They were perhaps the first occupants of a large part of England, but they were later driven west into Ireland and north into Scotland by another group of Celts. The Brythons or Britons, Brythons, B R Y T H O N S, or Britons, B R I T O N S, probably a spill over from France. The Gaels lived relatively undisturbed in Ireland until the invention of Scandinavian Vikings or Norsemen in the 9th and 10th centuries. The Scandinavian were defeated by the Irish in 10114 and they were absorbed by the Gaels. The Irish were converted to Christianity about the middle of the 5th century by St Patrick. The person St Patrick was a Christian Briton taken prisoner by the Irish raiders after the Roman withdrawal from Britain early in the 5th century. St Patrick became the patron saint of Ireland. His missionaries carried the torch of Irish Christianity to England and the earliest Irish poetry dates from the time of St. Patrick. Literary activity came to an end after the conquest of Ireland by Henry II in 1182. Since then, there has been little of interest in Irish literature until the Celtic revival in the beginning of this century in the work of poets and playwrights such as W. B. Eats and James Sinjay. Ireland remained under English rule until she became in 1937 an independent state under the name of Ire, e -I -R -E. The Celts of England Brethons of Britons occupied the southern half of the Iceland after driving out the Gaels. Their history begins with the Roman inventions under Julius Caesar. When Caesar was subduing Gaul, G -A -U -L, the Britons of England sent aid to the Galli, G -A -L -L -I, the cousins of Gaul. Galli was the cousins of Gaul. Caesar thereupon invaded England just to punish the allies of conquered Gaul but did not penetrate deep into the country. His expedition was exploratory and was followed by another next year. This was not a success. It was not until the reign of Claudius century later that Britain was finally conquered by the Romans in 14.3 Anno Domini. The Romans conquered Britain but they did not push north into Scotland. In order to defend their northern frontiers against the Picts, Picts who were painted men and Scots. They built a wall called Hadrian's Wall. It means Picts and Scots built a wall which called Hadrian's Wall. Parts of this wall still exist in present era too. Under the Roman rule, Britain was converted to Christianity and otherwise Romanized. The Romans built roads villas and baths and made London an important trading center. But when in the 5th century the German barbarians threatened the frontiers of the Roman Empire, the Roman legions L -E -G -I -O -N -S, in occupation of Britain 
were withdrawn for service at home and the island was left defenseless when the romans withdrew they left nothing behind except a few road and names of towns it is curious fact of history that while france and spain became roman in language and culture four centuries of roman rule did not leave any permanent mark of latin civilization on britain the latin language roman art and culture disappeared without a trace the latter latin influence in english language and literature came through the normans now the roman occupation the long peace and the benefits of civilized life had made the britons to soft and unwarlike to resist the fierce invaders that began to pour into britain after the withdrawal of the roman armies the first invention took place in the middle of the 5th century to be followed by others till the end of the 6th century most of the britons were exterminated others retreated to cornwall wells and stacheclidae and some migrated to armorica a r m o r i c a later that armorica was called brittany by britanje b r e t a g n e in lower brittany a language similar to welsh is still spoken ironically the britons the original inhabitants were called welsh or foreigners by their conquerors the britons of wales have distinctive language and culture this distinctive language and culture have had little influence on english literature beyond furnishing the tales of arthur which traditionally believed to have been the last king of britain before the coming of anglo saxons the pre christian celts were a barbarous people with a primitive pagan religion dominated by priest the druids d r u i d s in spite of their barbarity the celts were romantic mystery living and humorous they were certainly less grim and gloomy than the anglo saxons being a visionary and impractical people they did not achieve any important political status in europe the invaders such as angles saxons and jutes came from their homeland along the northern shores of germany they were low german tribes allied in race and language they were barbarians who worshiped heathen gods some of the days of the week are named after them wednesday thursday tuesday friday they were merciless in war they hated towns and they lived in wooden huts the jutes came first under their leaders hengist and horsa in 450 anno domini they settled in kent to be followed by saxons south and west the angles settled along the eastern coisi and being the most numerous gave their name to the holy country angle land or england the conquest was completed by the end of the 6th century many petty petty kingdoms were set up all fighting with one another the anglo saxons kingdoms that assumed importance in the 7th and 18th century they were northumbria in the north mercia in the center wessex in the south 
and Anglia in the east. The names of the Saxon kingdoms remain in this day in Essex. Means East Saxons, Wessex, means West Saxons, Middlesex, means Middle Saxons, and Sussex means South Saxons. In Norfolk means North Folk and Suffolk means South Folk. We have place names of the angles of the East Coast. The language was Low German dialect. For example, a branch of the West Germanic language. It was a highly inflected language like modern German, Sanskrit or Latin with complicated case endings and elaborate gender. The case endings have in course of time disappeared, the place being taken by prepositions. The grammatical gender of Anglo-Saxons have been replaced in modern English by the much simpler gender based on sex, masculine, feminine or neuter. The first step that put the Anglo-Saxons on the path of civilization was their conversion to Christianity. Their Celtic neighbors of Wales hated them too much because they become as a Christian. They were converted to Christianity by Roman and Irish missionaries in the 7th century. A band of missionaries under St. Augustine arrived in Kent in 1597. They were well received by the ruler who allowed them to build their first cathedral in Canterbury. The king embraced Christianity and permitted the missionaries to preach freely. Christianity came to the north of England a generation later through the Irish missionaries of St. Patrick and St. Columbia. The missionaries spread not only Christianity among the people they also introduced the Roman alphabet which replaced the runan or symbolic curse and scratches on wood or stone the only writing known to Anglo-Saxons. This was a very important step for the development of English literature. With this new facility at the hand, the runs were turned to letters. They gives us the old Anglo-Saxon stories such as Beowulf for the first time in civilized form. It also opened the way for the production of English literature in English soil in the writings of Cadmon and Cinewulf, Canterbury in the South. Canterbury in the South, York and Jarrow in the North became great centers of Christian and secular learning in the 7th and 8th century. The three great scholars who achieved European fame were such as Theodore of Tar Tarsus, Archbishop of Canterbury who was called Bede, and last one Venerable Bede of Jaru who was Aline. A L E U I N. This glorious period of English learning, however, did not last long, for England was invaded in the last years of the 18th century by Norsemen or Scandinavians from Norway, Sweden, and Denmark. They were all called Danes by the English. They were pirates and plunderers and they were hardier and fiercer than the Anglo-Saxons. They carried fire and sword everywhere, destroying churches, monasteries, schools and libraries. Soon the entire England was overrun except the south, where Alfred the Great King of Wessex made a stout resistance. The Danes were defeated in 878. They made peace of promising to become Christians and leaving the south and west to Alfred. 
they retained the north and east of england which was called the danelaw d a n e l a w the successors of alfred not only reconquered the danelaw but also extended their rule over the whole of entire and parts of scotland the danes settled down under saxon rule and the two races became almost one by intermarriage then in 973 there came to the throne of england ethelred the unready a weak selfish and foolish king who undid all the good work of alfred a fresh tide of danish invention swept england and ethelred in state of fighting the invaders began buying them off with a tribute in the form of tax called the dangeld this only served to attract more and more dens claiming dangeld thus minas the foolish king resorted to treachery one night is piece of time the english instigated by the king they fell upon the sleeping danes and killed as many as they could lay their hands upon instead of rip, ripping the whirlwind provoked by this deed ethelred ethelred fled to normandy the son of ethelred e t h e l r e d yes the son of ethelred whose name was edmund Ironside, Edmund Ironside, I R O N S I D. Edmund Ironside fought the Danes bravely, but he was betrayed by a traitor and killed. There being no one to succeed him, the Saxons were compelled in sheer despair to accept Canut. Canut was the king of Norway and Denmark. Canut was a good and wise king. He played an important part in uniting the Saxons and Danes into the one nation. He employed Danes and Saxon alike, same. So he was the loyalty of his subject that he sent away his armies to Denmark. The Saxons and Danes lived side by side. Soon. forgot their old enmity enemies as they were essentially of the same stock and spoke different forms of the same language the two languages in course of time became practically one canute's wisdom is illustrated by the well known story related by the holinshed of how he rebuked his countries for their flattery by showing that he could not command even the tide a small portion of water though they said he was king and all powerful canute's sons did not live long so in 1042 the english throne was restored to a saxon king whose name was edward the confessor edward the confessor was the second son of ethelred he had been brought up in normandy he was more french than english he appointed his norman friends to high offices he was called confessor because of his pious and saintly character he was a weak king and he was instrumental in bringing england under the rule of normans as edward had no son the english national assembly the witan w i t a n who was anxious for a strong ruler chose harold harold was the son of the saxon earl godwin as their king but harold was not of royal blood so william and the king of norway each laid claim to the english throne the king of norway in collision with harold's brother tosting landed in northumbria 
एन ओ आर टी एच यू एम बी आर आई ए हेरोल्ड डिफिटेड द नॉर्वेजियन फोर्सेस बट ही वॉज इन द नॉर्थ विलियम लैंडेड हिज फोर्सेस इन द साउथ हेरोल्ड हरीड साउथ बट हिज आर्मीज वर टायर्ड विद अ लॉन्ग मार्च एंड ही वॉज डिजर्टेड बाय द नॉर्दन अर्ल्स द फेमस बैटल ऑफ हेस्टिंग्स वॉज फॉट ऑन ऑक्टोबर फोर्टीन वन थाउजेंड सिक्सटी सिक्स दो द इंग्लिश फॉट हिरोइकली देयर इन्फेंट्री वॉज नो मैच फॉर द नॉर्मन कैवलरी एंड दे वेर डिफिटेड हेरोल्ड वॉज मॉर्टली वाउंडेड एंड द विक्टर विलियम बिकेम किंग ऑफ इंग्लैंड द नॉर्मन कॉन्क्वेस हैड फार रीचिंग कॉन्सिक्वेंसेज फॉर द फ्यूचर ऑफ इंग्लैंड इन ऑर्डर टू अंडरस्टैंड दीज इट इज नेसेसरी टू नो अ लिटल ऑफ द ओरिजिन एंड अर्ली हिस्ट्री ऑफ द नॉर्मस द नॉर्थ मेन हु ऑल्सो कॉल्ड नॉर्थ मेन दे वर नोन एज वाइकिंग्स वी आई के आई एन जी एस दे वर जर्मेनिंग पीपल्स ऑफ स्कैंडिनाविया एंड डेनमार्क दे वेर अ प्रोलिफिक पीपल they were forced by the pressure of population to seek their fortunes abroad during the 9th and 10th centuries they terrorized the whole of europe we have seen how they began invading england towards the end of the 8th century and ultimately settled there the northmen of sweden founded a dynasty in northern russia the swedish swedish were called hoes r h o s or rovers r o w e r s and the conquered land came to be known as russia or the country of rovers r o w e r s early in the 10th century the french king charles the simple was compelled to make peace with these fierce barbarian marauders m a r a u d e r s who had been raiding france for years he allowed them to settle in the north of france as his vassals v a s a l s this territory came to be known as normandy and its settlers as normans in the 11th century the normans conquered england and set up normans kingdoms in southern italy and sicily they became christians they adopted french manners customs they attained a high degree of civilization despite all this however they remained for long a cruel and violent people the norman warriors clad in full armor fought on a horseback with lances unlike the english who fought on foot and with heavy battle axes they had an instinct for political unity and organization the first effect of norman rule in england was the political consolidation of the country as a result england became a feudal state like other european states in the middle ages the feudal system was a system of land tenure based on military service it is usually described as a pyramid with king at the apex and nobles knights squires and peasants or serfs in descending order forming the body and base all land belonged to the king and was held at his pleasure for the barons in return for military service knights held land from the barons and squires from the knights each owing military service to his superior at the bottom was the peasant or serf bound to the soil and to his lord under this system the conquered sections were reduced to serfdom serf dom or slavery doomed to abject poverty and degradation all high post in church and government were held by normans who treated the sections with contempt 
French was the language of the court and of the upper classes. Latin, the language of the learned, mostly the clergy who occupied the highest positions not only in the church but also in the government. The English language remained only a spoken language. It was used only by the poor as English ceased to be a written language. No important literature was produced in England for about 200 years except in Latin and French. So Latin and French was become the most important language. But the surprising fact is that English though suppressed so long ultimately trimmed over French and English was overcome the French. When it finally emerged as the language of the United Norman Saxon nation in the 13th century, it was a richer and more flexible language. It had absorbed by it had absorbed much of the French vocabulary. Many of the words connected with government rank and honor, jewelry, military affairs, religion, architecture, cooking and dressing so familiar to us in English. English are French in origin and were borrowed in the years after the conquest. The Normans enrich not only fields of romantic French literature. English scholars began translating Latin religious literature into English and by and by produced original religious writings of their own which culminated in Lang Langland's Peace Plowman. P I E R S Pierce Plowman P L O W M A N and Wycliffe's Bible. The romances of jewelry that had gathered round Charles Magne C H A R L E M A G N E and the knights were translated into English and were made popular by wandering minstrels. This popular enthusiasm for French romances of jewelry soon led to the Englishman's producing original literature of his own. The stage was set for the appearance of Chaucer with his Canterbury Tales. Chaucer was the first great English poet, sums up the achievements of medieval England in the field of literature. But the greatest achievement was the fusion of Anglo-Saxons and Normans French into the unity of the first national poet. The national consciousness had been developed by a number of historical events of the preceding three centuries. King John's misrule provoked wide discontent and uh, brought together under one banner all ranks of the people, barons, clergy, knights and citizens. Their joint demand compelled John to sign the Magna Carta in 1215. Magna Carta was the greatest charter of English libraries. John also lost Normandy and his other French territories until John's time the kings and barons had occupied themselves with French and European politics. During the years from the loss of Normandy to the Hundred Years War, which was happened between 1337 and 1453. It began by Edward III to drain the French positions. The French position, the English kings turned more and more to English affairs like the conquest of Wales and Scotland, and they became English kings in reality. Wales was conquered and Scotland though unconquered, was anglicized, A-N-G-L-I-C-I-S-E-D. The institution of parliament in the reign of Edward I also helped to foster the sense of United Nations by bringing together all classes of people for a common national purpose. The Hundred Years War, which resulted in the loss of England of all her French positions except Calais, C A L A I S. He had yet one compensating advantage. 
the english and the normans were both equally proud of the glorious victories over the french won at crecy c r e c y poitiers p o i t i e r s and agincourt a g i n c o u r t it was soon apparent that it was a racial war and the normans and the english alike hated the common enemy who was called the french they regarded french as an enemy language this feeling put an end to the snobbery of the normans who now began to think of themselves not as a separate race but as a one people with the english the character of a people is determined by many factors the chief of which are history and geography while some characteristics of englishmen may be traced to their ancestry and the events of history others can be explained only by the geography of england living in an iceland the english are a seafaring people bold roving and adventurous the tang of the sea is never absent from the literature they are spread all over the world and their empire while it lasted was the greatest the world has known their iceland position has made them insular and exclusive and while their climate which was misty rainy and cold has made them hardy and tenacious it has also made them a little too glum and unfriendly to be universally likable but under his forbidding exterior the englishman hides a heart of gold his sense of honor of justice of fair play and his loyalty have won him respect everywhere the practical necessities of life in an iceland have made him eminently practical in outlook he hates abstractions and generalizations he shows his practical common sense in conservatism as well as in compromise his habit of understatement is the most eloquent testimony not only to his sense of humor but to his inborn stoicism that hates display of emotion the english landscape with its undulating plains hills valleys rivers and lakes green lands meadows which explains the englishman's love of the countryside and the beauties of nature but above all the englishman loves freedom this is a recurrent theme in english literature he is instinctively law abiding but quite as instinctively hates laws an englishman's house is his castle because he hates restrictions he is impatient of anything that savors of interference with his personal liberty in the above assessment we notice certain contradictions in the character of the englishman he is friendly at heart but appears unfriendly he has a genial sense of humor but appears quite humorless he feels deeply but appears cold and unfeeling he is law abiding but hates laws it is perhaps on account of these contradictory traits that foreigners say the english are mad how you are this is a joke take him all in all and the englishman embodies the rough good nature of his anglo-saxon ancestors tempered by the elegance duty g u i e t y and chivalry of the french so this was the point origin of english literature origin of english language sorry origin of english language now we will discuss on the literature of anglo saxon age or period it is customary to begin the history of english literature with an account of anglo saxon or old literature 
Anglo-Saxon literature is also called old literature. This literature is unintelligible to the present day Englishman and more so to a foreigner. Anglo-Saxon or Old English is to all intents and purposes a foreign language. It is really a low German dialect. It has to be learnt like a foreign language with the help of a teacher, dictionary and grammar as it is a highly specialized subject. It is no longer forms part of English courses even in postgraduate classes except in a few universities in England. English literature properly English literature properly so called begins with Chaucer in the 14th century but since but since it has its roots based in Anglo-Saxons Anglo-Saxon is a brief survey which is a necessary for a proper understanding of later developments. The earliest literature of the Anglo-Saxons must have been oral. It was passed down by word of mouth from generation to generation. It was later carved on wood or stone in the shape of runs or mysterious symbols for the Anglo-Saxons had no alphabets. We have seen how the Christian missionaries introduced the Roman alphabet in England and how the runs were turned to letters. As the writers were Christian monks, they embellished this literature with Christian sentiments and reflections. So we cannot say that this literature is direct reflection of the national genius. But even thus modified picture we get is of a semi-barbarous people who cherish certain aristocratic virtues like courage, honor, loyalty and love of fame. Another interesting feature is that as their pagan literature is modified by Christianity, their Christian literature is to adapt it to their pagan traditions. That's why Anglo-Saxon literature is also so much important. So now we try to know what is Anglo-Saxon literature. So firstly we will talk about Anglo-Saxon poetry which is also called pre-Christian poetry or heroic poetry. Talking about Anglo-Saxon poetry it is the poetry which is cover entire age of Anglo-Saxon. Most of this verse is religious, only a small portion being secular. Of this secular verse, title Beowulf, B-E-O-W-E-L-F. It was a so much, so much famous verse. It is the earliest and the greatest epic in Anglo-Saxon age. It is a poem of more than 3000 lines. It celebrates the heroic deeds of the warrior. The warrior who gives his name to the poem. Title Beowulf. Beowulf sails from Sweden and he comes to the rescue of Rodger. H-R-O-T-H-G-A-R. Rodger was a king of Denmark whose feasting hall is nightly raided by a terrible monster and that monster name was Grendal G R E N D A L Grendal carries off and devours his warriors Buell fights with the monster and kills him but the scourge is not over for Grendal's mother even more terrible than Grendal. And when Grendal's mother got this news, so she attacks. Buell plunges into the lake at the bottom of which she dwells and kills her with a magic sword. Buell finds his party then return home laden with honors and gifts from Rodger. 
50 years later when beowulf is old and king and he was became the king of sweden he distinguishes himself in another heroic feat a fire belching dragon guarding a treasure has been provoked and is ravaging the land the old the beowulf was even though he fights and kills that dragon but he is he himself mortally wounded in the encounter the poem beowulf has some notable passages describing the wild northern landscape the most famous being the description of the marshy lake the dwelling place of grendes mother the most remarkable quality of the poem is its haunting melancholy it is cheerless and gloomy in its tone and atmosphere its burden is the even sense and emptiness of life of fame and glory and the total effect of the poem is depressing the chief interest of the poem consists in its portrayal of customs and manners of the heroic past heroically it takes us back to the first half of the 6th century and the events described took place in scandinavia not in england where the anglo saxons had begun establishing themselves as early as the 5th century beowulf himself was a git g e a t or goth g o t h he cannot be said to be a national hero of the anglo saxons in fact the heroes of anglo saxon poetry were not national but they were common to all germanic people such as anglo saxons goths burgundians b u r g u n d i a n s or lombards l o m b a r d s in spite of the primitive civilization pictured beowulf is not uncivilized the anglo saxon ancestors of english cherished idols of nobility generosity courage fortitude and fame the poem is only partly historical because of the mixture it in it of the romantic and the marvelous two other poems of the free christian period which tells us of the primitive past and these poems are the first poem is a widsit w i d s i t h and the second poem is deor's complaint d e o r apostrophe s complaint c o m p l a i n t both these poem are the songs of two wandering minstrels widsit who is the far traveler he has wandered over the germanic lands he visited many princes he sings the praises of the princes who have honored and conferred gifts on him deor's complaint is the sad tale of a poet the poet who has been supplanted by a rival in the favor of his lord he consoles himself by remembering the misfortunes of others before him and ends every stanza with a refrain the english passion for the sea and the adventurous life is well illustrated by the seafarer s e a f a r e r seafarer is a poem it is a lyrical poem of great power but marred by the obscurity and in this era we find the war songs also composed and there we find the nearby two war songs were so much famous first was brunnau bhura b r u n a u b u r h and the battle of maldon brunnau bhur celebrates in spirited verse the victory of athe athelstan Athelstan was a king of Wessex. He was made his victory over the combined forces of the Scots 
and dens in 937 the second war poem the battle of maldon in even more the battle of maldon in even more spirited verse recounts the defeat of the english at maldon in 993 at the hands of the dens in this poem we have a noble predecessor of latter english battle songs there were other battle or war songs such as battle of the baltic and charge of the light brigade now there was a another poetry based on the christianity it is also called christian poetry by far the greater portion of as poetry is religious it is associated with two names cadmon and cinewolf cadmon c a e d m o n cinewolf c y n e w e c y n e w u l f cadmon is a historical and cinewolf is more or less mythical the story of cadmon as related by bede b e d e who was also poet and bede was a famous poet in this era cadmon was an unlettered cowherd at the monastery with bai to whom the gift of song came by miracle unable to sing at a section feast cadmon retired to his stall abashed and humiliated suddenly an angel appeared and commanded him to sing of the creation cadmon thereupon sang of the creation and of the creator and his glory the most notable of his poems are versions of genesis g e n e s i s and exodus e x o d u s to the mythical or semi mythical cinewolf is attributed all the rest poetry partially original and partially translations or adaptations from latin or the originals so cinewolf wrote the poetry such as christ lives of the saints juliana and elen and guthlack and the dream of the root so these were some poetries for example christ next one juliana next one elen next one guthlack g u t h l a c and last one dream of the root so the last poetry titled dream of the root is the most interesting written by cinewolf in this the root or the cross relates its adventures from the time it was cut off from a tree in the forest until it received jesus who was crucified on it anglo saxon christian poetry is duller than free christian heroic poetry its chief defect being its rhetoric with elaborate periphrases the resulting verbosity smothers the simple austere eloquence for the of the original whether the bible or the lives of the saints for example where the bible says and god said let there be light and there was light the anglo saxon has the creator of angels the lord of life bed like appear on the limitless ocean the order of the most high was accomplished with haste the holy light spread over the immensity as the creator had required lego is so the forms in which the writer the poet is try to present their verse the style in which the writer try to present their verses their poems talking of about the form and style in the anglo saxon poetry so they determined by its their language the anglo saxon language is rough its words were hard and metallic the poetry uh, is crude and rough but even more serious is the shortcoming of its versification the stock formula is a line of accented alliterative syllables syllables 
with a middle pause alliteration does lend a musical charm and it has always been used with great effect in english poetry but the excessive and regular of the anglo saxon words makes it not only monotonous but also artificial no advance lay along this line of prosody and anglo saxon poetry came to a dead end even after its sudden and glorious revival in the 14th century by langland and few others further this monotony of versification is aggravated by the cheerless gloom of tone and temper even the anglo saxons love of nature is tinged with melancholy gloom instead of treating of the softer aspects of nature such as the spring sunshine and flowers anglo saxon poetry dwells on the harsher and wilder aspects of the elements such as stormy seas hell and thunder to make matters worse this poetry is marred by verbosity high sounding words and long winded periphrases by way of explanation and elaboration the anglo saxon poets cannot speak simply after talking poetry we must try to focus on prose also because it also started it has a so special begin in this era after verse prose was the important uh, form of the literature in present era and the simple reason was that men habitually talk prose and in primitive stages do not think of it as a fit medium for artistic expression though the earliest anglo saxon prose dates from the 8th century the principal documents of any interest belong to the 9th and 10th centuries these consist of works of king alfred alfric a e l f r i c and wulfstan w e w u l f s t a n both alfric and wulfstan were religious writer of 10th century the last two are comparatively of little interest as producers of literature their work being confined to the writing of homilies or sermons the work of alfred cannot thus be passed over alfred was not only a great king he was also a great literary figure alfred is usually regarded as the founder of english prose prompted by the desire to educate his people he himself translated latin works into vernacular besides supervising translations by others his own translations was the history of geography sorry the history and geography of orosius o r o s i u s a 5th century latin writer the ecclesiastical the second one is the ecclesiastical history of bede and third one is consolations of philosophy of boethius boethius was a roman philosopher of last 5th and early 6th century in addition to these under his ages the famous anglo saxon chronicle began to be written it is believed to have been partly written by him it certainly owed much to his inspiration it is the most important work of anglo saxon prose which records the history of england from the time of the roman occupation to the middle of the 12th century alfred died in 899 but additions to the chronicle continued to be made after his death anglo saxon prose is of less literary interest than verse but it is more or less continuous with the latter developments of the language in other words anglo saxon prose is more nearly allied than anglo saxon poetry to modern english this is a point worth remembering for anglo saxon worth as we have seen came to an abrupt end with langland in the 14th century and was heard no more later 
or modern English poetry beginning with Chaucer underwent a revolutionary change. The poetic rhythm was to depend on the number and kind of fit FWT in a line rather than on the number of syllables. Anglo-Saxon prose was subjected to no such revolution in as much as it was either the ordinary speech of the people or formed on Latin, the language of the learned English language or formed on Latin, the language of the learned English language we have seen was under a shadow of 300 years after the conquest and when it emerged trimmed in the 14th century, Old English poetry was thing of the past, archaic and absolute, but Old English prose had a new lease of life. In this way, we discuss about the literature in the Anglo-Saxon or Old English age. So here I stop. Thank you. See you.